Welcome to Diabetic Retinopathy, Preserving Your Eyesight at Diabetes Eye Health. My name is Dr. Richard Beezer, and I'm a senior physician and chair of the Continuing Medical Education Committee at Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston, Massachusetts. I am pleased to serve as moderator for this program. I'd like to introduce Peg Abernathy, our patient presenter, and doctors Timothy Murtha and Deborah Schlossman, who are ophthalmologists at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Tim, Deb, a patient comes in for yearly screening and shows signs of diabetic retinopathy. What do you do to confirm the diagnosis, discuss it with the patient, and then decide on the best treatment? Okay, well the first thing, um, the first thing we would do is a dilated eye examination and examine the retina uh, carefully um, using special lights and lenses. And often we use various types of photos to help with our diagnosis. Um, we have photos that actually take pictures of the retina and we have imaging that can measure swelling in the macula. Um, but I would like to reiterate what Tim said. Uh, just 40 years ago, we had no treatment at all for diabetic retinopathy and I just find that hard to believe. Uh, the first studies that showed uh, laser to be effective were done in the 1970s. And uh, the, the studies were just remarkable. These were patients with uh, proliferative retinopathy and, pro and laser treatment was shown to be uh, more than 60% effective in reducing severe visual loss. In fact, the study had to be changed two years into it to allow treatment of eyes that were uh, being observed because it was thought to be uh, ethically wrong to um, withhold treatment for, of these eyes. So this was in the 70s and then in the 1980s, we had uh, laser treatments for macular edema, and this also was shown to be 50% effective in preventing moderate visual loss. Um, and really, that laser has been the mainstay of treatment um, until about five years ago. Um, and the limitations really are for macular edema, because unfortunately, uh, we'd often keep treating uh, macular edema with laser and often didn't see much improvement. Um, so we're very fortunate that in the past five years we have these uh, anti-VEGF medications and agents that can be injected into the vitreous, and these have been um, remarkable in improving vision and preventing loss of vision. And Dr. Murtha is going to talk more about that and also vitrectomy. Yeah, Tim, why don't you uh, fill us in a little bit of some of these uh, about some of these advances? Absolutely. So over the past few years, we have uh, developed some pharmacologic agents that are now very effective at helping us treat various forms of diabetic eye disease. As we just heard, laser treatment has clearly been the gold standard for many years. And the main goal of laser treatment was to preserve vision. So we were hoping to just maintain what our patients had. And in many instances, that was very good. We, we were quite happy with that, and it was a huge improvement from where we were before. But there was always this burning question, can we do better? In the search for doing better, we came to understand the pathology of diabetic retinopathy a little better. And over the years, we've come to find that there is a critical protein uh, in the eye that promotes the development of diabetic eye disease. And this is called vascular endothelial growth factor. Once we isolated this and determined its value in diabetic eye disease, efforts could then be turned at trying to figure out how we could inactivate this particular molecule. By doing so, we can then hopefully avoid the complications of diabetic eye disease. So over the course of the last 10 years or so, three medicines have been developed to help in this area. And what they are called ranibizumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercep, otherwise known by their trade names as Lucentis, Avastin, and Ilea. And your doctors will talk to you about these when it comes to treating the eye. Currently, the benefit of these particular medicines are primarily for the process that we call diabetic macular edema that Dr. Schlossman described a few moments ago. This is a process where the center area, the macula, is affected by diabetes such that there's swelling in the retina. And this swelling distorts vision and blurs vision, and if allowed to persist, will cause a gradual degradation in vision that may be permanent. We would like to avoid this. Treating in the center area with laser treatment is not possible. The damage that laser treatment would cause would be just worse than the disease itself. So it was a, no, a non-starter to use laser treatment for this particular problem. With these new medicines now, we can treat this. And there have actually been studies that have compared 
laser treatment for diabetic macular edema and anti-VEGF medications for macular edema. They were published five years ago, perhaps, and the difference between the two is quite remarkable. With anti-VEGF medicines, we have more people gaining vision now. Understand that. We are now talking about gaining vision. We're not preserving it. We're getting more vision. We have fewer people losing vision. When you actually look at the gains compared of laser compared to anti-VEGFs, it is dramatic. We see nine to 10 letters of improvement with anti-VEGF medicines compared to one to two letters of improvement. So with anti-VEGFs for diabetic macular edema, we are having more people improve, fewer instances of vision loss, and in those groups that are improving, we're having greater levels of improvement. This has been just absolutely dramatic to us. Beyond that, the process of, of treating is a difficult process from the patient's perspective. The first difficulty is getting over the idea that someone is going to place a needle in your eye. Certainly it sounds somewhat draconian, and it does take quite a bit of education, as people will attest to, uh, to convince them that this is the appropriate treatment. Once we get beyond that, though, the treatment is fairly time intense. It requires monthly visits, four injections on a monthly basis, at least in the beginning. And that can be difficult because it often requires patients to come in with family members who need to take time off from work and other responsibilities. Having said that, it's still worth it. Through the first year, it requires perhaps seven to eight injections. By the second year, we can reduce that to three to four injections. And by the third year, you're really only getting maybe one to two injections. And with that, you are having improved vision such that you can maintain your driver's license, maintain your independence, maintain your mobility. Yeah, Tim, I, I think that's, that's really dramatic. And, and uh, Peg, perhaps you've, you're going to tell us more about your experiences later, but you've had these injection therapies. How was it? You know what? I never thought I'd see the day where I went thumbs up for an injection <laughs> in the eye. You know, I mean, seriously, I am the poster child for this treatment. Sure, it's, it's like you said, it's, um, it's barbaric to think that someone's going to come at you with a needle, right? And it's the idea. But first of all, for a 15, 20 second injection versus going blind, it's a no-brainer. And also, in a nutshell, um, they they dilate or they uh, numb the eye with drops and then they put a teeny tiny little numbness needle over here that you don't feel. And then by the time you get to the actual injection, you f I don't feel it. Go figure. It's just the idea of it. Yeah. And uh, he, did, uh, he did trick me into the very, very first time I had it done. Uh, real quickly, I'll say that he did trick me into calming down because I was scared. I was propped open. I'm like, oh my goodness. And he said, okay, you see this needle? It has, I mean, you see the syringe? It has no needle on it. So I'm not doing anything right now. I'm just <laughs> going to check, measure. I'm going to measure. I said, okay, measure. He measures the eye and he goes, yeah, about two, yeah, and made up some story. And he said, okay, Peg, are you ready? And then I said, yeah. And he said, well, I already did it. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, and so it's <laughs> really thumbs up and thank you for these guys. This these guys are tricky. Oh. Tim, just briefly, uh, you mentioned a vitrectomy. Uh, just briefly, tell us a little bit about what that involves. So, in the instances where our step approach to treating diabetic eye disease isn't as successful as we would hope, and by step approach, I mean medical management first, sugar control, blood pressure control, cholesterol control. If that isn't holding the line, then certainly laser treatments still apply. And, and we still use these on a regular basis. We have not done away with laser treatment yet. And I believe it will always have a role. If that doesn't control the situation, then we can move on to the antivascular endothelial growth factors, as I just described. If all of these measures are not doing what we need to, and we have to deal with bleeding in the eye, scar tissue in the eye, traction on the retina, then we still have another way of trying to help people do better. And that's a surgery called vitrectomy, where several small incisions are made in the wall of the eye. Through, through these incisions, we pass several instruments, which gently remove the jelly, the hemorrhage from the eye, allow us to visualize the retina, 
allow us to apply more laser if appropriate, to peel away any scar tissue, and ultimately to restore vision for our patients. Well, let's, let's hear again from Mark, uh, a patient who's experienced a vitrectomy. Not that I, the first vitrectomy, on, and the, which was on my right eye, didn't, uh, uh, didn't do what we hoped it would. Uh, I started to have uh, vi vision problems and floaters in my left eye, which is now my only functional eye, and I was down to 2070 vision in the, in the time period between 1986 and 1992. Uh, very nervously went in to uh, have another closed vitrectomy, you know, this time on my left eye. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it, it was very successful, uh, I, even after all that time since ni 1992 to, uh, to now, uh, my, uh, my sight is solid 2020 and, uh, and, and everything is stable, which is the best news I can get. Let's, let's handle a couple of questions here. Uh, one question I wanted to know, is this typically seen in one eye, both eyes? Tim, Deb? Usually in both eyes, but often to a varying degree. So um, it's unusual to see a dramatic difference between the two eyes, but sometimes we do have one eye that's progressing more rapidly, one eye is needing laser, the other eye we're just watching closely. And I'd also like to, to just mention that we determine um, the intervals of our visits to, uh, by how the retinopathy looks. So people with mild retinopathy we see once a year, and then if there's more extensive retinopathy, macular edema, other things we're following, we see people as often as every three to four months. Yeah. So. And, and Peg, you had some differences in your eyes too. I did, a little bit more in the right eye. Uh, initially, and we'll go into this later, but I had the treatment, the laser treatment, and then uh, the anti-VEGF treatments. I had two rounds of each, and then uh, it held beautifully for a couple of years and then recently this summer I went back in for my because I keep going every mm -hmm. four months or so and he said your left eye is great it's holding well the right eye is showing a little bit of edema and so they wanted to do the injections and so they've done two and when I get back home uh, to California where I'm from then I'll get the third injection. And okay. Thank you to Judentech for their support of this educational program. I would like to remind you that additional videos are available at diabeteseyehealth.com. Thank you for joining us.